Alrighty. So, uh, welcome back. Today, we're going to take what we learned with uh, query evaluation, and we're going to kick it up a notch. We're going to start uh, figuring out how we can use uh, information about the, the way that the data is structured in order to make uh, our evaluation, uh, the, the task of evaluation, um, a little bit easier. Uh, now, I want a quick show of hands. There's, a, some, there's been a couple of requests for an intermission about halfway through the class. Um, I know this uh, an hour and 20 minutes can be a bit long. So uh, are people OK with like a five minute break halfway through? Show of hands, yes? Cool, OK. Um, so we're going to do that. And I'm going to try, uh, try and keep doing that. All right. So let's get going. Uh, before I begin, uh, one other thing. Uh, there's been a cup. There's been a little bit of confusion, so I just wanted to throw in a couple of clarifications. Um, first off, uh, we talked at the way back in the beginning of the class about uh, the create table statement, and in particular, uh, the, both the primary key and the unique um, keywords. Uh, just so this is uh, really, really clear. Uh, both of these mean effectively the same thing. Uh, essentially, both of them act as a uh, an enforcement of that attribute, the the tagged attribute being a um, a key. Uh, but the distinction between them is that a primary key acts as sort of the the main. The, the, the main way that the database is going to use to sort all of the, the data. Um, this is actually quite relevant to today's lecture. Uh, this is basically the, the main, uh, when the, the primary key attribute is specified, that's what the uh, database is going to use uh, to sort all of the records that are in the table. Uh, the unique key only acts as sort of a correctness check. Um, now, some databases might be smart enough to uh, adapt, uh, modify unique uh, key into a primary key constraint. But in general, uh, primary key is going to have a positive impact on database performance, while unique will typically have a negative impact on performance. Uh, one other correction, or, or I should say clarification, um, there's, a little bit, there's been a little bit of confusion on uh, the notation of join operations. So there are three kinds of join operations in general. Um, the first denoted by a, a simple cross is the Cartesian product. Uh, so this is basically the, the full enumeration of every element of one, uh, tel, uh, one relation paired with every element of the other relation. Um, the join operation uh, denoted by a little bow tie symbol there uh, represents some selection predicate applied to this. And the one sort of major piece of confusion that we've been seeing is that uh, if you omit the uh, the bow tie, you should always think of it as having a little subscript underneath it, uh, expressing the selection predicate that is being applied, uh, the, the filtering predicate that is being applied to the join condition, and uh, sorry, to the, the join's output. And if the there is no subscript, what that means is that uh, what you can refer to that as is a natural join, uh, which is to say you take every attribute that appears in both columns and you do an equijoin on all of those attributes. So if, you, if you're trying to express uh, a specific join, you need a subscript uh, denoting precisely what your, your join condition is. Uh, otherwise, the general assumption is that it's a natural join. Uh, any questions on that? Is, is this clear? All right. Cool. So um, let's, one last thing. Uh, Anyone who has just walked in, uh, drop off your uh, assignment two with uh, Vishravas, because um, he's going to be leaving in a couple of min a minute or two. Uh, and while that's happening, uh, here's a little bit of group work uh, to get you up and running. Uh, so turn to your uh, nearest neighbor. And I have this query up here. Uh, I'd like you to come up with both a relational algebra expression that uh, captures the, this uh, selection predicate and I'd also like you to come up with, um, for your specific plan, for the specific relational algebra expression that you've come up with, 
uh, what the maximum working set size is, as we talked about last Wednesday, and what the time complexity of that expression is. So turn to your nearest uh, two or three neighbors. And if you haven't already done so, drop off your assignment with uh, Fisher of us. Alrighty. So, someone, uh, let's get a hand. Uh, who, what's uh, what's an equivalent relational algebra expression to this uh, to this query? You guys need another minute or two, or yes.
So something like this. Okay, what's the time complexity? say that? Uh, Alright, uh, which, can you point to a specific operator uh, that would make this n squared? The, the intersection? Okay. Alright. So, so there's another, an equivalent plan. Projection. Of that uh, is n because the time complexity of this is one per row, the time complexity of this is one per row, and you have n rows here. Great. And in this case, the time complexity of all of these operators is uh, one per row, uh, except for intersection, and intersection is reading from uh, two tables of size n. Probably get intersection down a little bit further than n squared, but yes. Okay, uh, so we have two different uh, plans. What about the working set size? What's the working set size of each of these plans? One tuple, good. All right, uh, one more quick uh, example for you guys. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated version of more or less the same query. Uh, let's take about three minutes or so.
Alrighty. What's a good relational algebra plan for this? Or how would you how would you convert it? Yes. Select. reading from Officer and Ship, I assume? All right. Uh, what kind of time complexity are we looking at here? No, well, you're right. It's, uh, there, there's an implicit assumption that there is a foreign key constraint here. Um, you should never, in general, you should never assume that there are foreign key constraints unless one is explicitly provided to you. So in this case, you're right, n squared. Although uh, an intuitive interpretation of this query uh, would suggest that there is, uh, in general, going to be n, the complexity is going to be n. So you, you're spot on. Um, okay, now, so let's, let's take a look at um, the, that, that claim here for a moment. Uh, this is going to be n squared. Or, sorry, uh, this is going to be n uh, squared. But in, in practice, is this join going to have to deal with all of this data? No. Um, why? Come on, this is easy. Someone, someone speak up, be brave. Selection predicate, great. All right, so this is going to kill a very large chunk of the data. So while we may have n rows, in general, we're only going to be processing a small chunk of them here. On the other hand, the selection predicate itself is going to be fairly expensive. It's going to involve uh, a fair uh, visiting every single tuple that you encounter. So one of the focuses for today is going to be making the observation that there are better ways to evaluate certain structures in a relational algebra plan. So for example, what we're going to be looking at most aggressively today is this uh, structure of a selection operator composed with a file scan operator. And when this occurs, becomes very, uh, there are a number of ways that you can use uh, to improve the performance of that. So, um, all right. We just did that. So, the, the basic problem that we're going to be trying to address is the observation that this selection operator, um, the correct way to do it, or sorry, uh, the selection operator, um, if it visits every single data value that, uh, that you have as input, that's strictly speaking going to be correct. 
um, if you test every single row, that is guaranteed to produce the right answer. Um, there's something to be said for producing the right answer, uh, but that particular strategy is uh, not necessarily going to be so efficient. So what we'd like to what we'd like to do is organize the data in such a way that we can uh, take advantage of that organization uh, to make that selection operator uh, much more uh, efficient. So uh, quick uh, quick show of hands. What are some strategies that you might uh, consider to organize the data? Yes. Hmm? Indexing. Okay, so that's uh, so you can index the data. Um, anything else? Sorting. Okay. These are both actually quite related. Um, you can take the data and you can uh, either organize the data itself, or you can create a data structure um, above uh, that is also sorted or organized. So. Let me break that down into this handy dandy slide here. Um, there's, you can sort the data, you can um, partition the data, which you can think of as a, as a sort of form of sorting, um, or you can index the data. Um, and uh, a point that I'm gonna be trying to get across today is that indexing is effectively uh, identical to the first two strategies. The only difference is that rather than sorting the actual data, you're sorting some pointers into the data. So what, uh, what might be an advantage of uh, sorting the data versus, let's say, partitioning the data according to some, uh, some predicate, like a, a hash function? Yes? Okay, so sorting the data can be really expensive. Um, with, so that applies to the, the sorting. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, so building, so doing things like partitioning may require you to allocate partitions, uh, space for partitions that don't actually have information. And this is a common problem with uh, hash-based partitioning. Any other thoughts? We have sorting can be expensive. We have, uh, there can be a lot of space uh, consumed. What about, uh... okay, so we'll, we'll get back to this question in a, in a couple of slides. Um, but I want you to kind of think about what is, uh, as we're going through this, uh, I want you to kind of think a little bit about what are some pros and cons of each strategy? So really sort of the, the high level idea of indexing is that an index is exactly like taking a data file and sorting it, but rather than storing the actual data, what you're doing is sorting, the, uh, sorting a set of pointers uh, to the actual data. So, if I were to keep track of this, this second list of, uh, of data values sorted on B, why might I, uh, one, one additional advantage of, um, of using an index is that if you have a data file, you can only really sort it uh, according to one, one sort order. Uh, if I want to uh, have this data file and I want to be able to very efficiently do lookups on both A and B, uh, I'm not going to sort it on both A and B. So what I can do instead is sort it on one of those two, sort it on A, for example, and then build a second, uh, a second file which contains everything sorted, but the, the, uh, rather than storing all of the data in that index, I have pointers back to the original data set. So, how would I do a lookup on either of these? So let's say I wanted to do a lookup on A, and I had these two data sets. I wanted to find uh, A is equal to three. How would I do that? I just had an array uh, of these values as is. How would I do that? Someone suggest an algorithm. 
Binary search, cool. So I do a binary search on which of those? The, the sorted data, yep. Uh, how would I do a lookup for B? Just testing to see if you're awake here. Okay, so you do a uh, you do a binary search on the index, and then follow the pointer back to the original data. So, more generally, um, let's say that you had the ability to create a data structure, create uh, whatever data structure you wanted to, and you knew that you were getting you're going to be getting a lot of um, selection predicates of this form. A is equal to some number. How would you organize your data? Let's say sorting was, was your main uh, organizational tool. Yes? Sort it based on A, and then how would you do the lookups? Um, what about if you knew that you were getting a lot of uh, inequality credits? A is less than some value. A is greater than some value. So you'd use a binary search, but how, what's the... Um, what's different? So ha how does um, how does the algorithm for uh, answering the first selection predicate differ from uh, the algorithm for the second? Yes. until you hit the value that you're looking for. Um, what about if it was a greater than predicate? So A is greater than 5. How much you answer that? Could you use the same algorithm? Okay, so you, in that case you'd start from the end and go back. So you wouldn't even need binary search in that case. What about... We'll get back to that in a moment. So here's another one. How would you answer uh, the following predicate? Or how would you organize your data in such a way that you could efficiently answer a predicate like this? A is equal to something, B is equal to something. All right. Uh, think, yes? Sort, uh, how would you sort on both A and B? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll get back to this. Uh, keep this in the back of your brains because I think a couple of slides from the end, um, we'll, we'll get back to this. Okay, so let's, let's generalize this a little bit. We have a selection predicate, and a selection predicate consists of uh, typically an, a Boolean formula of a Boolean formula of atoms. We would like to create a wrapper around our, our data files. We'd like to have some way of abstracting out um, the organizational structure of that data file so that we can very easily answer specific kinds of questions. Um, for example, we'd like to create an, uh, a way of um, organizing the data so that we can very efficiently answer questions of the form x equals y. Give me all of the ships uh, where, sorry, all of the officers whose ship is 1701A. And 
And in addition, we so what we're going to be uh, what we're going to be focusing on today is two different classes of um, two different classes of, of lookups. Uh, one on equality search, uh, one on equalities. Uh, such as I just described, and one on uh, range lookups. So give me all of the um, all of the elements that fall within a specific range. Um, all of the officers whose rank is at least three. Now we talked about using binary search for this, and binary binary search is a great general algorithm, but we run into a bit of a problem when we try and apply it here. So let's say that your data is completely sorted, perfectly organized on whatever attribute that you're, you're looking for, um, but it's uh, spread ac across a huge number of blocks. In this, case, let's, in this case, let's say you have four gigabytes of data. How many IOs are going to be required uh, to find a single record using binary search? Hmm? Log in. So, uh, specifically for this example, how many? 20. Okay. So, well, you guys have already answered this. If, uh, in general, for n blocks, uh, you're going to need log, uh, and specifically, log base 2 of n. Now, 20 IOs is really, really high uh, for just one record. Um, you guys have, uh, in assignment 2, you guys have already sort of done the cost of, uh, tried to find the cost of, uh, um, of uh, reads on a hard disk. This is expensive. This is horribly expensive. So one thing we'd like to do is try and reduce the cost, um, the cost of this uh, lookup process. Now here's a question. This is log base two. Why is it log base two? Uh, can I get a hand? Okay, what do you mean by two children? So every time you pick a value, you partition the search space in two. So you have your, uh, your data file, and you know that at the very beginning, you have all of the data. Now by doing one lookup, uh, in this case, let's find me the middle value, you partition the search space into two chunks. One that's less than five, one that's greater than five. And the process repeats until you find uh, the value that you're looking for. Um, so as you're doing a binary search, you're kind of building this tree structure. And that tree structure has a binary branching pattern. So can anyone take this? Uh, uh, so how would? How might we use this insight to reduce the the, cost, the number of IOs? Uh, any thoughts? It's log base two because the branching structure here has every uh, node in this tree has two branches. Yes. Add more children. Widen your branches. Exactly. So if you have a binary tree, uh, it's going to give you log uh, base two depth. Uh, an n-ary tree is going to give you log base n depth. And that's basically where uh, this idea of indexing uh, begins. So an index data structure is essentially a, a, a data structure that's going to uh, organize your, your data One very compelling reason to build an index is that it allows you to organize not just, uh, use not just the, the existing uh, sort order of the data, but it allows you to uh, sort of compactly represent uh, the, the search structure that you need to follow. All right. So going back to a uh, couple of decades ago, um, some of the early databases used uh, an index structure called uh, ISAM, or Indexed 
index structured access method. Um, and this was basically a way to, uh, given a sorted data file, reduce the cost of doing lookups um, on the data. And really the, the structure here uh, is pretty much uh, a K, uh, an n-ary tree. Uh, you have all of your data, uh, data elements organized on disk, and these are referred to as your leaf pages. And then sitting on top of those are, um, are what are called non-leaf pages, which contain uh, in essentially information on how to branch out, uh, how the branching structure of the tree is organized. So the best way to describe this is to actually describe the construction process. Um, so starting off from the very beginning, you have your, your data, which is organized in, uh, in sorted order, whatever way, uh, whatever sort order uh, you're interested in. Then as, yeah. Oops. Yep. so then you're going to figure out the value um, at the end of every single block. Um, in this case, well, I've got an example coming up in a couple of slides, but you're going to find uh, the, the last element on every single block, and you're going to build a uh, non-leaf page that sits above every, let's say a leaf page can contain um, n values. It's going to contain uh, it's going to, to contain uh, the last data value that's on every single page and a pointer uh, to the next page. So one leaf page is going to capture n leaf pages. And if you have... Um, a hundred, if you have a hundred pages, then you're going to have a hundred over n uh, first tier non-leaf pages. Now the process repeats. For every one of those leaf pages that you just created, you're going to group them into groups of n, where each of the second tier non-leaf pages is going to contain the last data value in the leaf page that it's pointing to, and then a pointer to, to that leaf page. So, right. Let's see an example here. I have here an ISM index with a branching factor of three. As you can see, I have a set of data values uh, and each of those data values is going, each of the leaf pages includes a partition uh, between each of the pointers. So if I want to do a lookup on this, let's say for a value of uh, 27, I'd start at the root, and the root has three different point, uh, three pointers. 27 is less than 40, so I'd follow the left pointer. I have two pointers in the next tree, 20 and 33. 27 falls between 20 and 33. So I'd start, uh, so I'd follow the pointer that's in between those two. Now I'm finally at a data page, and I can find the value 27. Yes? I'm glad you asked. Um, but I'm going to ask you to hold that question off. Actually, no. Uh, I will answer that question right now. So the B tree data structure is, it actually evolved from this. Um, and 
in a lot of ways, it's almost the same. Uh, there is the main distinction between a B uh, tree and an ISAM index is what happens when the data changes. So in an ISAM, so how would I add, uh, how would I add a number here? Let's say uh, I wanted to add uh, 23 to this, in, to this data structure. How might I modify this data structure, so, or how might, what operations should I do to add 23 to my sorted list? Yes. So add 23 over there. Ah, okay. So uh, what do you mean by push? Uh, why? Or what, what is the motivation for changing the index value? So the index, uh, the index values here act as separators. If I have um, the 20 over there is saying that nothing in the blocks to the left is greater than 20. And everything to my right is greater than, uh, all of the blocks pointed to by pointers to my right are greater than 20. So if I was adding a 23 to this, what would need to change? Uh, d describe the process from the very, uh, to an even lower level. So you add a 23 to, so you're adding a 23 to this page, right? Let's say you had enough space on that disk page to actually store the 23. Would that index value need to change? No. Because everything pointed to by that middle pointer is still between 20 and 33. Now what happens if you don't have enough space? Let's say that these pages can only store two data values. What would you do in that case? A new page. And how would you, uh, where would you put that page? How, how would you, um, so, Remember that all of these pages here are contiguous. This is one flat data file, and this whole index structure is built over that. So if I wanted to insert a 23 here, and I didn't have enough space on that page, what would I have to do? Okay, so you potentially have to rebuild the entire file. Uh, yes, so the, in the worst case, if you really, really wanted to, um, to keep this index structure intact, you'd have to basically rebuild the entire index. Now, uh, there's some workarounds, and the B, both the B plus tree and the ISAM index have slightly different ways of approaching uh, working around rebuilding the entire index when something changes. Um, in the case of an ISAM index, um, the, the workaround is basically to have what are called overflow pages. So if I wanted to add a 23 to this, I'd add a pointer somewhere in this, uh, somewhere in this page that redirected me to another page. If I wanted to add more data, I could do just the same thing. Um, and every time I uh, run out of space in one page, I create another, uh, I add a pointer pointing to some other page somewhere else. Um, right. So 
the sort of foundational idea behind an ISM index, or the, the sort of core, core thing that distinguishes an ISM index from a, a B plus tree, which we'll get into shortly, uh, is mainly that all of the data pages are contiguous. This data page follows, uh, is followed by this data page, which is followed by this data page, which is followed, and so forth. Um, what's an advantage of that? Why might, why might I want the, all of the pages, to, the data pages to be contiguous? Yes, so because they're contiguous, I can just scan through the entire sequence and be able to uh, access the entire data set um, in one pass. But as you, can, as you can see, if the data is changing, that may not necessarily be a good thing. So um, let's have a quick intermission, and then uh, we'll get back to B plus trees in the last a uh, half an hour or so. So be back here at 5.55. Alrighty, let's carry on. So, uh, an ISAM index is built on top of a sorted data file, and it basically allows us to access into that data file with many fewer IOs. So rather than uh, log base two IOs, we get log base K IOs, where K is however many pointers we can fit into uh, a single data page. Now, as we saw, there's a associated uh, cost with that, namely we can't uh, efficiently update the contents of, uh, of this table. So if the, the data changes rapidly, we end up with uh, these long, overflow blockchains. So what people came up with and what is now pretty much uh, the de facto standard are these things called B plus trees. A B plus tree is very similar to an ISAM index, uh, structurally almost identical, uh, but unlike a uh, ISAM index, it handles insertions much more gracefully. One additional feature of this, so unlike an ISAM index, uh, which is kind of static, a B plus tree can change. Uh, every time we do a, uh, an insertion into the, the data file, we can potentially split uh, a node into, uh, sorry, a page into two new pages. Now, for one thing, this means that the, the data pages are no longer necessarily going to be contiguous, but um, it allows us to, a little more flexibility in the indexing structure. The, the B plus, the, the downside to this is that it means that the indexing structure, the, the depth of this indexing structure will vary over time. And it also means that there's a possibility that um, you end up with hot spots where the index structure is really, really deep. So one of the uh, insights behind a B plus tree uh, is that you not you restructure not only the data pages, but you, you actually restructure the entire uh, index structure as well. Uh, what's called rebalancing uh, the tree and making sure that it's um, that the the B plus tree is at a consistent depth at all times. So really the focus of a B plus tree is that um, all of the operations are going to be focused on keeping the tree balanced, keeping the depth of the tree uh, consistent. Now in order to give us ourselves a little bit of leg room, uh, a little space to grow as well as to shrink, um, in an ISAM index, all of, these le all of these index pages were filled to maximum occupancy. Uh, you, you keep them as full as possible to make sure that the, the depth of the tree is as low as possible. In a B plus tree, on the other hand, we have a slightly different optimization criteria. We want to make sure that the 
we want to give ourselves a little bit of space uh, both to grow the tree and to shrink the tree. So what we end up doing is making sure that each leaf uh, contains some, uh, we set thresholds on uh, the, the amount of data that can be stored in a given leaf. Um, we make sure that it never contains fewer than 50% uh, of uh, the entries that it can hold, but at the same time, uh, it can, that gives us a, a good amount of breathing room uh, between 50% and 100% fill. Once again, the, the sort of focus of all of this is to make sure that the, the tree depth stays consistent across the entire B plus tree. So as before, uh, as in the ISAM index, we have a set of data pages, and those data pages are linked together. So unlike an ISAM index, uh, the pages aren't necessarily sequential. Uh, this means we need to keep a pointer. If we want to be able to do sequential scans uh, over that data, we need to keep pointers uh, in between the pages. Uh, so we can organize the pages kind of in a doubly linked list. On top of that, we have a set of index entries. And those index entries look almost identical uh, to the ISAM index. So if we want to find, let's say, five, we do the same thing as before. We, do a, we read the index page in. We find the, um, we use binary search on the index itself to find the, ent the next largest entry in this case, 13. So 5 is less than 13. And we follow that pointer to find the data page that it's uh, recorded on. We want to do 15. Once again, we do a binary search on this data page. And we find the next highest entry, 17. Uh, 15 is between 13 and 17. And we follow the pointer there. And if we want to find all of the entries that are greater than 24, uh, we how would we do that? You had this answer first uh, earlier, right? Anyone? There, there are two ways of, of doing this, one of which was you mentioned earlier in class, right? So you find the first entry that's relevant, and then you do a scan over these pages following the pointers. Uh, there's another way that was suggested earlier that could be potentially more efficient. Start from the end and go backwards. Uh, each of those is, is a reasonable way to do this. OK, so, um, so index lookups work exactly like they would in an ISAM index. The main difference between those two is that in a B plus tree is in how a B plus tree is modified. So this is a bit of a uh, bit non-trivial. Uh, the, the process basically starts with the leaf data pages. So we find uh, to insert a new value into a B plus tree, we find the data page where uh, the value would be uh, normally stored. Um, if there's enough space on that page, great, we're done. Um, if that's not the case, if we actually need to, uh, if we don't have enough space on that one page, we need to take that one page and split it into two new pages. We do that, and then now we have to update all of the pointers in the leaf node that's sitting above us. Now, that splitting process might end up, uh, it's going to create a new entry in the parent leaf node. But it might be the case that that uh, new entry overflows the parent leaf node. And if that happens, you need to start uh, recursively, uh, you need to split the parent leaf node and recursively move up the stack. So let's, uh, let's 
see an example of this. So how would we go about inserting an 8? What's the first step? Yes? Is that a hand or? OK, so we go there, and we try and insert an 8. All right, so let's focus on that. Let's say that uh, an 8 is, uh, overflows that page. So we now have to split that page into two bits. So we're going to pick the middle value here. Uh, and the middle value is going to be a 5. So we're going to take that one page, and we're going to split it into two new pages. Uh, one containing 2 and 3, and one containing 5, 7, and 8. Now we have that 5. What do we do with the 5? Right, so we have the same problem that we did before. Um, we have to put it into that, uh, the parent index, but the parent index can only hold four values. So we need, to, um, we need to take the parent index, and we now need to split that into two new parts. So just like before, we take the middle pointer, uh, and we split on that. Now there's a difference in how we split the um, there's a difference in how we split the, um, the, the non-leaf nodes here because we don't actually have to keep track of all of the data values. So what we're going to do is we're just going to actually take that, uh, that value and remove it from the two children altogether, and we're going to take the two, uh, we're going to take the two uh, halves on either side of that pointer and um, include and uh, create new non-leaf nodes. So in this case, we take our 17. Um, 17 was the middle value. And we make that, we put that into our new root node. And then we split the other two uh, accord as before. And so just to see that in the context of uh, the whole data set, uh, once again, we took these. We took that page, we split it, and then we took that index node, and we split the seven, uh, split this node off from it uh, using 17 as a dividing value. Now, now let's say we wanted to find 16. How would we do that? OK, so from here. OK, so we follow the left child now. OK. OK, so there's nothing else here. It's greater than 13, but it's also less than 17. So that's the pointer we follow. And there's a 16. So why? Why do we take the 17 and uh, why, why doesn't the 17 appear in any of these? Any of the second level non-leaf nodes? Excuse me. So if we're, if we're visiting this pointer, what values, what are the bounding values for this pointer? More than 13, less than 17. So as you're descending through the tree, you're keeping, if you move to the left of a pointer, you're guaranteed that the value to the right is the same, stays the same. Um, you can keep the, the, the parent pointers, uh, sorry. The information that you, the, the, the 17, uh, you can think of this 17 as kind of living on the right-hand side of this index structure. It's the rightmost uh, counter in this structure and the leftmost count, uh, the leftmost value in this structure. Uh, and because of that, you don't need to replicate it. Now, 
we said earlier that the we were going to try and make sure that the uh, that whenever we um, we said earlier that we were going going to ensure that the uh, the index nodes never got smaller than 50%, never had fewer than 50% of uh, their capacity, and never more than, well, never more than their complete capacity. How do we, does this splitting algorithm ensure that? Yes, and uh, why? So every time we split, we never get, uh, we are only splitting when they're full, therefore every uh, split value always has half of the, the uh, full capacity. Great. All right, so let's look at deletion. Deletion works pretty much the same way, except in reverse, uh, rather than, yes, in the back. So in that case, you can't extract the value of 17 from that tree because it's not in the pages. Um, what do you mean? Oh, um, so you have to pick a, all of these index values have to be selected um, using, they have to be members of one of the two sides. So in this case, uh, what's a good example? Uh, the 24 here, uh, 24 appears in that page. Um, so the comparison is uh, less than or values that are strictly less than the pointer here fall on the left-hand side. Values that are greater than or equal to fall under the right-hand side. So where would a 17 live? Which page? This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Or that one, yeah. So it's greater than or equal to that, less than, or e uh, less than 24, it would live in that page. So deletion happens exactly the same way. Uh, the only difference is that the uh, rather than splitting pages, uh, now we need to merge pages together. So let's say we have this uh, this data set here. Uh, we would like to delete 19. Well, just deleting 19 is perfectly fine because we're not uh, getting rid of. Uh, we still have at least a 50% fill in this page. But as soon as we delete 20, now we have a problem. This page is less than 50% full. And that means that we need to merge it with something else. Now, there's a couple of heuristics that you can use for this. Uh, the first one being that if one of the adjacent pages has content in it, you can pull content in from an adjacent page. In this case, the page on the right had three elements in it, so we can take that um, we can take uh, 24 from there, the lowest element in that page, and we can shift it over. Now, when we do this, that means we in turn also need to update uh, the index to have the right pointer. But now, let's say we delete the 24. We get rid of the 24, and now we have a uh, a page that can't pull in any new value, new data from uh, its adjacent pages. So we actually need to take that page and merge it with one of its adjacent pages. So we're going to take the right page, and we're going to uh, take all of its content and move it over uh, into this, this page that we just deleted from. When that happens, we need to, uh, one of the, the parent pointers goes away. And because of that, we now have a situation where this index page is smaller, uh, has less than a 50% fill. So we need to merge that page back in with the pages adjacent to it. There's a similar situation that could occur if the pages on the right-hand side um, had to be reshuffle. So let's say we had this situation where this index page has less than a 50% fill, but the index page on the right is already full. We'd like to take some of the elements 
in this uh, in the left hand side index page and move them over to this index page so that we preserve uh, our fill. We can do that by uh, doing this sort of reshuffling dance. So. This, so like I said before, you can kind of imagine that this 22 here is actually sitting on the right hand side here and on the left hand side here. So what happens is that you kind of go back to that view and then you repartition on whatever the middle value is. And like that. The 22 shifts into the right position. The 20, which was adjacent to the 22, shifts into the, uh, the new position. And then the 17, which was in the middle, takes the place of the root node. So any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, so um, the way I've been describing this, every single deletion can potentially trigger um, a redistribution. If you can't do a redistribution, you uh, remove a pa an entire page. And if you can't, uh, that page removal might trigger some redistribution on the, the index nodes, and so on recursively. Um, if you're just doing sequential deletions, then the redistribution is actually fairly cheap. Um, so it's not strictly necessary to do this, uh, not strictly necessary to do this as, as a batch process. Um, there is, you can certainly do it as a batch process that, however. Um, there's, you'll get some benefit out of it. Um, Now, is there a way to, that you might be able to, one thing to, to note is that if you're, there's computation involved in maintaining this index. And one thing to observe is that if enough things change as part of a batch, uh, you may actually, there are situations where it's beneficial to actually rebuild the entire index from scratch. Just the, the work of maintaining the index is going, going to be a little bit harder than actually uh, rebuilding the index entirely from scratch if there are enough updates. So if you, if you change enough of the data set, uh, there's, you may, there are situations where you may want to rebuild the entire index from scratch. OK, so we've talked about ways of sorting the data and exploiting sorted data. And we've talked about how tree index structures uh, can help us uh, do that uh, exploitation much more efficiently. Um, we are running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to uh, turn this into a group work, um, and in particular, a group work on Piazza. Uh, let's say we have a condition like this. So this going back to the very start of the class. Um, we're looking for a specific ship, and then we have uh, some potential predicates on the rank attribute. How would, so I'd like this, this question discussed and answered on Piazza. Baked goods will be awarded to uh, those who participate. Um, the, uh, how would you, build an index structure that could efficiently answer uh, a set of predicates like this. How, uh, more precisely, how would you uh, build an index slash sort that can be used to answer predicates over multiple attributes? So uh, with that, uh, are there any final questions on uh, indexing? All right, great. So we'll get back to, uh, we'll continue indexing on Wednesday. And uh, if you haven't started on project one, 
uh, I strongly encourage you to do so. It is, the deadline is coming up.